Well, welcome to the 700 Club, a major shift in the war against Hamas. Israel has pulled out a key division from southern Gaza. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu declared that victory is a step away. Yesterday marked six months since the October 7th Hamas invasion. Hostage families gathered together in Jerusalem and Washington, D.C. to demand the release of their loved ones. CBN's Chris Mitchell has more. Israel's defense minister, Yoav Galan, says the pullout is a sign that Hamas is severely weakened as a fighting force. Hamas ceased to function as a military organization throughout the Gaza Strip. But within an hour, Hamas terrorists were firing rockets at seven Israeli communities from the area the IDF troops had just left. On the tactical level, what you can read into it is that the IDF is pulling out troops in order to get them some rest and time to reorganize in order to be prepared for the next stage of missions. That's one way of looking at it. Jonathan Canricus, a former IDF spokesman and a lieutenant colonel in the reserves, says that next stage of mission would be an invasion of Rafah. He also says the move can be seen as a result of American pressure. There was a few days ago an important and reportedly heated conversation between the president and the prime minister, and uh, demands were made, and you could think that what Israel is doing now is an implementation of those demands. Kenrika says the IDF is also preparing for a greater conflict with Hezbollah. Time will have to tell, and we will have to wait which one of the options it was, but it could be either one or a combination of all. Still, as fighting reaches the six-month mark, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu sees the elimination of Hamas just ahead. We're marking today six months of war. We're one step away from victory. Netanyahu and Gallant insist on an invasion of Rafah, where Hamas's last intact battalions are holding up. As it has for weeks, the White House disagrees. All I can do is say what I said before. We don't support a major ground operation in Rafah. That has not changed. And we're looking forward to having conversations with the Israelis about alternatives to those kinds of operations. Some families of hostages held in Gaza mark the six-month anniversary of their captivity at demonstrations in Washington and Jerusalem. Hostage mother Rachel Goldberg Poland told CBS Face the Nation she's in D.C. to find what more can be done to free the hostages. What levers need to be pulled in order to make this happen? Because six months is actually a complete failure on everybody's part, and we are feeling extreme desperation, despair. Netanyahu says his government won't buckle to international pressure on a ceasefire without freedom for the hostages. I made it clear to the international community there will be no ceasefire without the return of hostages. It just won't happen. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Uh, for all those calling for ceasefire, pay attention to what Hamas just did. Israel said we're withdrawing one of our, uh, one of our divisions. What a, a significant move, whether that's a ta tactical move to um, have them have a period of rest and rearming. Are they preparing for a war against Hezbollah? All of these things are, are playing into this decision. But in that withdrawal, you would think Hamas would say, okay, Israel's withdrawing, and, and that's a good sign. What do they do? They go into that area and start firing rockets at Israel. So all this talk about ceasefire, all this talk about innocent lives, all of this, please, can Hamas stop firing rockets? That's number one. Number two, can they release the hostages? Can they send them home? What is the strategic advantage at this point, as if there was ever one? It's a war crime to take civilians hostage. That's an absolute international war crime. I'm not hearing anybody talk about that in all of this discussion of ceasefire. So please, can Hamas, the pressure, be put there and not on Israel? Israel has enough pressure going on right now. And let me add to what Netanyahu is obviously carrying, the burden of all of this. His own minister of national security has said, if there isn't an invasion of Rafah, if Hamas isn't totally defeated, 
then the prime minister isn't going to have a government. The coalition will absolutely dissolve. So there's politics uh, in the United States. There's international politics. There's all kinds of pressure coming from the UN, other groups. But please keep the very clear moral picture. Hamas started this. Hamas has hostages. Hamas continues to fire rockets at Israel. What in the world do you expect Israel to do in response? They have to stop this. That's part of their national defense. It's their right of self-preservation. They can't help but do this. Well, here at home, the war in Gaza could play a decisive role in the presidential election. John Jessup has more on that story from the CBN Newsroom. John? That's right, Gordon. We're just about seven months away from Election Day, and right now the 2024 race is seen as too close to call. The U.S. relationship with Israel is one issue that could tip the balance. CBN chief political analyst David Brody explains why. Navigating how he handles the war in Israel is getting tougher for Joe Biden, not only as president, but also in his quest to win re-election. A consistent outcry by his party's progressive wing is getting louder and larger, pushing for action against Israel for what they call a genocide in Gaza. Following the recent tragedy involving aid workers, the Biden administration took a stronger tone, calling on Israel to take concrete steps to end the humanitarian suffering or else. If there's no changes to their policy and their approaches, then there's going to have to be changes to ours. The question of how far those changes go is key because Biden is trailing in the polls. A drastic shift against Israel could further fracture the Democrats' base, putting key swing states at risk in November. For example, the number of Democrats choosing uncommitted over Biden in key swing state primaries has been jarring. It began in February with Michigan at roughly 13 percent, then almost 19 percent in Minnesota. This month, 8 percent in Wisconsin. Rick Klein is political director for ABC News. He needs Michigan. And uh, I tell you what, at the mar this election seems, at least in those Rust Belt states, they're going to be one at the margins. Yeah, I think that's right, David. And look, Michigan is a little less close than some of the other uh, battleground states, 150,000 votes or so. Uh, but more than, you know, almost almost more than 100,000 people voted uncommitted in, in the primary. So if a big chunk of them decide to stay home or, or vote Donald Trump, um, then you start to, to see a, a real difference. Joe Biden really can't become president if he doesn't win, in, win Michigan. Later this month comes Pennsylvania, which has the country's fourth largest Jewish population. Middle East analyst Jake Novak spent time as media director for the Israel consulate in New York. If there's any state in the country where the Jewish vote actually means something, it's Pennsylvania. Since it has about 3% of the voting population, Biden will need to perform a political tap dance between progressives and Jewish Democrats in Pennsylvania and similar states. The biggest problem is that he's trying to dance at two weddings. That's an old Yiddish phrase. And you can't do that. On the Republican side, Donald Trump is also weighing in. As president, he took a strong pro-Israel stance throughout his term, although recent comments about quickly ending the war have raised eyebrows. What I said very plainly is get it over with and let's get back to peace and stop killing people. I'm not sure that I'm loving the way they're doing it because you got to have victory. Israel is absolutely losing the PR war. Trump has certainly had a reputation of being very, very strongly pro-Israel, but you're right, some of the comments he's made have, have made people question whether that's an un, un, you know, unending commitment or if there's limitations to that. Even with his isolationist views, there's little thought that Trump will push too far against the Jewish state. And my expectation is you're not going to hear a lot of kind of public criticism from Trump toward Netanyahu. There's no real upside in that. At the end of the day, Israel and, and, and Jewish people and, and Christians who support Israel know that Donald Trump has Israel's back. Some aren't so confident that progressive Democrats will have Biden's back. Could it cost Biden the election if it's close? Well, it, it's very likely to be a very close election. In that sense, almost everything could be the, dis, the, the difference maker. But it's very easy to see a scenario where this is uh, a defining issue. And uh, when the history of the 2024 election is written, that this is uh, among the factors that uh, determine its outcome. David Brody, CBN News, Washington. All right. Thank you, David. Well, for a little while today, Americans will turn their eyes from politics and world affairs and look to the heavens instead. 
Millions have traveled along a narrow corridor stretching from Mexico to Canada to see a total eclipse of the sun. CBN still heard as a story. It's North America's biggest eclipse audience ever. Thanks to the densely populated path it will take across the U.S. and all the social media buzz surrounding it. We've been talking about coming here for this event since, what, three months before she was born? In the zone of totality, a four-hour trek stretching from Texas all the way to Maine and 115 miles wide, the darkness will last up to four and a half minutes. Temperatures will drop as much as 10 degrees. So many visitors have traveled to see the phenomenon roads could be clogged and some areas have declared a state of emergency because of all the visitors. But whatever you do, don't try to view the eclipse without the proper eye protection. Looking at the sun with the naked eye is incredibly dangerous. The sun's UV radiation is capable of destroying the soft tissue in the back of your eyeballs. I got the uh, certified safety eyewear. I got UV filters for my camera. Almost everyone in North America will be guaranteed at least a partial eclipse, weather permitting. Unfortunately, some areas could only see clouds. The best weather is expected in New England and Canada. They do have weather concerns, but are really hopeful that we're going to have a very good experience. It's going to be disappointing, definitely, if it's cloudy. The timing and location of this particular eclipse has some reading biblical and prophetic significance. The fact that it goes over seven cities called Nineveh and one called Jonah makes you wonder, is this our Nineveh moment, America, a time to reflect on where we stand on a lot of issues. The next total solar eclipse in 2026 will only be seen over the Atlantic and in Spain. Alaska will have one in 2033, and the next chance for the lower 48 won't come for another 20 years. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Good little while. Thank you, Dale. Well, for the second time in three years, the light is shining on the University of South Carolina women's basketball team. The Gamecocks beat Iowa 87-75 to in last night's championship game, capping off an undefeated 38-win season. Iowa phenom Caitlin Clark, who finishes her career as college basketball's all-time leading scorer, denied a national championship. Tonight, the men's title game features returning champions UConn against the Purdue Boilermakers. The Huskies aiming to become the first team to win back-to-back -back championships in 17 years. You can be sure to watch tomorrow's 700 Club for our coverage of the game from Glendale, Arizona. And for Caitlin Clark, the end of a phenomenal college career.